Welcome back to The Look and Sound of Leadership, an ongoing series of executive coaching tips designed to help you be perceived in the workplace the way you want to be perceived. I'm Tom Henschel, your executive coach, and today we're talking about Ask the Coaches Your Questions. I've often said that my voice might be the only one you hear on the podcast, but there is a crew of people who help me get to the finish line each and every month. The last part of that sentence is still true. There are a lot of people to whom I'm really grateful that help create the podcast every month. But the first part of that sentence, that my voice is the only one you hear, after 10 years, that's about to change. A couple of months ago, I co-hosted the Coaching for Leaders podcast with Dave Stahoviak. In addition to Dave's weekly show where he interviews people, just interesting people, and he does it really well, once a month on the first Monday, Dave and his wife Bonnie do a Q&A show. And Bonnie, for whatever reason, couldn't do it one month, and Dave asked me if I would, and I said, oh, yeah, I would love to do that. What I didn't know was that it was going to be such a different experience for me. You know, I've been on Dave's show eight or nine times as a guest, but I had never done that. And when it was over, I liked it so much, I thought, I want to do more of that, and I wonder how that could happen on The Look and Sound of Leadership. And then the very next thought I had was of Mindy Dana. Mindy and I have kind of grown up together professionally. I've known Mindy for years. Mindy is now a coach here at Essential Communications. She is also one of the colleagues at this amazing company called Cultivating Leadership, where they get to do fascinating, groundbreaking, challenging work. Oh, my goodness. When Mindy and I get together, and we do get together quite a lot, usually for breakfast, we tend to talk about two things. We talk about our families, and we talk about our work. We talk about what we're learning from our clients. We talk about what we're learning from our colleagues. We talk about what challenges we've faced, what's of interest to us. The talk is really interesting. So when I asked myself who could join me for a Q&A show, like I did with Dave, Mindy came to mind about a half a second later, and Mindy is here. So I am so excited to introduce all of you to Mindy Dana. Hi, Mindy. Hello, Tom. It is, it feels, I feel so honored to be here. And I I'm, really do. I'm so glad to have you. So would you like to say a few words, or do you want to jump into our first reader letter? I'm eager to jump right in. Cool. Okay. I don't have any eggs to eat, so I think we can just jump right in. Okay. So here we go. There's a guy named James that I've been corresponding with over the course of, I would say, a couple of years. He writes and asks interesting questions, and recently he wrote this. What do you do to engage someone more fully? So often when I'm talking to someone at work or at home, I find that we're not engaged in a conversation or a dialogue, but actually dueling monologues, just waiting for the opportunity to speak. Do you have any ideas for listening and engaging, avoiding the trap of just waiting for your turn? I love that James, James, thank you for this question, because listening for me is one of the sort of juiciest and most powerful topics um, as it relates to leadership. And the first thing that popped in my mind when I read your question was, uh, we sometimes talk about listening to reload. And that's what came <laughs> to mind. That's a great phrase. When, when you said, how can I be sure that I'm, we're just not engaged in this sort of monologue of me waiting for my turn? The first part of your question was about how do you engage someone more fully? And so I would turn the question to you and say, James, when you're listening to someone, to what extent are you engaged in what they're actually saying? Imagine if you start with you and sort of intentionally, and I think listening really is intentional. Um, it is a mindset, first and foremost, of it's standing in a mindset of, I really am curious about what this person has to say, and I'm going to engage myself fully. And I think if it starts with you demonstrating that, that it may be reciprocated. What do you think, Tom? Well, I think you and I both have had a journey around listening. And then I got to witness something that was just really just interesting to me. I was like, oh, wow, I get it. So I'm doing this course with a guy named Jeremy Rowley, who's a actor, creator, writer, artist. And he and I do improv for leaders because Jeremy is really 
deep in the world of improvisation as a theater craft. So Jeremy's been studying this for years, but he teaches it to non-actors. And there's an exercise that happens early, early, early that sounds incredibly simple. So it's a, everybody's in a circle. So it's maybe 10 people. It's maybe 40 people. I've seen it done with a lot. And it's called One Word Story. So Jeremy would say to you, I'm going to give you a proper name. You say the name. You turn to the person next to you. The next person has to add one word to build a story. That person turns to the next person and so on and so on and so on. It sounds easy. It's not. Because what we do is we watch it coming towards us like a wave in a stadium. It's like, oh, it's coming close. So, oh, I know. I'll say bulletin board. That'll be clever, right? You know? And then you say it gets to you and it's like, oh, no, bulletin board doesn't work. And you so you... Maybe you say it and it's clear you weren't listening. It, it, it's so bumpy and it's funny and, you know, fine, but it's a listening game. And what Jeremy told me is that with people who do this, who, like his colleagues who've all been studying a long time, they can stand in a circle and do it and it almost sounds like one person talking because they have learned to listen in such a freeing kind of way that they can just zip that ball around the circle. That's a completely different kind of listening. And it's a learned skill. It really is. And the thing that, as you were describing that, and I've played that game and it's painful. I usually blame the person <laughs> right before me. I had a perfect story and you just screwed it up for me. Um, <laughs> the thing that came to mind, I think it was Carl Rogers who said, the reason that we really, really don't listen to other people is because we're afraid that if we really listen, we might actually have to change or change <gasps> our minds. Ooh. And when... And I've observed that in coaching others. It's like that, and in myself for that matter. If I really, really listen, listen to what you're saying from your perspective, not mine, but from yours, that's very challenging because it challenges my sense of who I am. So um, in addition to listening to reload, quote unquote, there's three other levels of listening that we talk about and teach. And they are, uh, the first one is listening to win. And that probably sounds familiar. That is when it's kind of that's what I'm inferring from your question is that you experience that where you're listening to someone else and you're just collecting enough information so that you can either discredit or dismantle or win in the in the conversation that you're having with that person. And it can be really well intentioned sometimes. If someone comes to you and says, Oh, I think I really screwed that up, and you say, Oh no, you didn't. That's its own version of listening to win. Mm. The next one is listening to fix, which is oftentimes what well, again, well-intentioned, and in some cases really appropriate of you're describing something or describing a problem to me, and I'm just immediately listening and putting, putting things together and saying, oh, I can fix this for Tom. I know. I know. I've seen this before. Mm -hmm. um, and that's applicable where there is an answer and we actually know what the problem is, but there are times when we really don't know what the problem is and we don't even know that there is an answer, and that's when listening to learn is really, really powerful. Is that the third one? And that's the third one, listening to learn. And that's really driven by genuine curiosity and an openness to the possibility that I might actually be changed by really listening to you. Listening to win, listening to fix, listening to learn. Yes. Great. Oh, that's so helpful. Thanks. Thanks for your question, James. You want to go with the next one? I do. The next question comes from Chris. I've always wanted to hear your take on finding direction and deciding what career to pursue when you feel stuck. Many folks feel unhappy about the work they're doing, but have trouble deciding what they should be doing instead. How do you know what you want to be? Hmm. Interesting question. I've been through a career change. Mindy's been through a career change. Many people have. I think this question is a hard one. And here's what I do these days with my clients. I point them towards people and resources. So people... Um, I belong to a group called the International Coach Federation Los Angeles chapter. There are a bunch of career coaches there. That's what they do for a living. They coach differently from me and from Mindy. They coach exactly on what you asked about helping people figure out what they want to do next in their lives. So number one, there's that. If you want to find a coach who can help you with that, I want to encourage you to go to the ICF website. It's ICF. It's, I'm sorry. It's coachfederation.org. And you can... Click the Find a Coach tab and find someone who does career coaching and go work with them. That's great. Number two is resources. These days, oh my goodness, it's the internet. There's a million podcasts about careers, uh, but there's also books. And I just want to mention the one that I used back probably in the late 80s, maybe 90s, which was What Color Is Your Parachute, right? I mean, you're yep. nodding your head. Yes, yeah. it's familiar. Yeah, well, What Color Is Your Parachute was 
uh, an eye opener for me because it had all kinds of assessments that I'd never done before. You know, now I look at it and I go, oh, they're familiar. They're not that unusual. But in those days, for me, it was a first. It was really helpful. They do a different version every year. Every year they update it. So now it incorporates onlines and resumes. And not, it's a huge book. Not all every page of the book will be relevant to you. But the ones about helping you know what you want to be, that's one of the books that can help you. There are many. So use the resources around you. That's how I'd answer, Chris. What about you? Boy, this this question really does resonate because for a couple of reasons. Because I had did my, my own sense of being stuck at one point. And also I have a couple of daughters who are at a point in their lives and their careers where they're trying to make these decisions right now and it feels daunting. Mm. And so the thing that came to mind with your question, Chris, is pursuing what you're really curious and interested in. And that may not look like a job yet or a career per se. But I found in my own history, when I feel kind of stuck, the first thing I do is I go take a class or I go learn something new. I mean, that is my, as soon as I feel stuck or bored, I pick my head up and go, what am I curious about? And it doesn't necessarily have to fit into any kind of, oh, will that lead, to, this will lead to this job. But more often it's just something I think, hmm, I'm pretty curious about that. I wonder what that might lead to. And as I look back at my career, I can see how those dots connected those things, those kind of breadcrumbs that I was curious about and went and learned about led to me being where I am and loving the work I'm doing now. Um, so I would encourage you to really sit with what am I curious about? What do I care about? And go learn something about it, either in a classroom or in an online community or with a community of people that you think have that interest. Nice. I hope that was helpful, Chris. We're going to an email from Colin. This actually came through the website when I very first mentioned that I was going to do a Q&A show and I talked about Mindy. Colin sent a note through the website and he started it by saying, Dear Tom and Mindy. Colin, thanks so much. That was so great to read. And then here's what Colin wrote. He said, I'm about to take over a new team for the first time and I'd love your thoughts on developing a good way to approach this. And then Colin, with great clarity, articulated many factors that he felt were critical to the team's success. He listed processes and people. He listed functions. He listed values and communication and rapport. He was thinking very broadly about this thing called team leadership. And then at the very end, he simply asked this, what can I do to be the best leader out of the gate? Well, I think I would like about an hour for this question, <laughs> right, <laughs> Colin, it was big. because honestly, there's so many things to think about and ponder. But I would have to say that as I read your question, you are already off to a really good start because you're giving it the kind of depth and breadth of thought. Um, so I really appreciate that. You've thought about, you mentioned values in your question. You mentioned processes. You, you, you talked about bringing on new team members. You talked about the fact that it's going to be a virtual team and the fact that this you will be a first-time leader or supervisor. So those are all really relevant things, and it's, I think it's fantastic that you're thinking about all those elements to it. I guess the first thing I would say is that when you make the move from being a high performer, and I'm surmising that you're a high performer because you're being considered for this promotion. The move from being a high performer of doing the work and actually leading and developing a group of people who are doing the work is really different. And it's a really big shift in identity of I'm rewarded for doing the work to now I'm rewarded for helping others build their capacity to do the work. And so just recognizing that that's a big shift, um, I think is a, an important first step. I have lots more I can say, but I'm going to Turn it over to Tom for a minute and see what your thoughts are. I'm with you that it read like a success story to me. Like, wow, I was so impressed that Colin was thinking so broadly about the idea of leadership and the fact that he could consider all that. And then what I thought was, hmm, where do you start? Because you can't do all those things at once. So, Colin, what I want to say to you is good for you for thinking about all that stuff. You should be thinking about all that stuff. I hope you can reduce it to a bullet point list post it somewhere, look at it, do a little bit at a time, all the time. And then I had a thought, which was, who's going to help you? I think in order to be so multifaceted and to remember like, oh, that's right, I have to shift gears. Oh, I haven't done anything about communication this week or this month. 
it's often helpful to be talking about it with someone, a mentor, a someone. It, it might be a family member. It doesn't matter, but that you're going to have someone who's going to listen to you think about what's going on with your work so that you have some time to reflect. I think what Mindy and I both see all the time is we have leaders who just, they can find the answer when they take the time to reflect on what needs to be done. I want to encourage you to find a person, partly because you're going to give yourself that time to reflect. I think what you're asking is terrific. And there is no one answer. That's the other thing that I want to say, which is there's no right way to do this. You're going to do it your way. You're going to be your version of a leader, even your mentor. You're not trying to duplicate anything. You're trying to find your voice, your footing, your style, your manner of leadership. And that's a great thing. So go at it. Have energy. Have joy. Do your best. No, you're not going to make everybody happy. You're not going to make everybody happy. Get over it. Get forward. So have a good time with it. There's a couple of resources I would I would um, turn you to also. Um, one is a book by Linda Hill called Being the Boss. And it's a really fantastic, really practical book about kind of first-time managers. And the other one is um, Google did an exhaustive study called the Aristotle Study because in their fashion, they, they figured, well, we can figure out what makes the perfect team. We'll build the algorithm. And it was much more complicated, much more complex than they ever imagined. But what the one thing that was really interesting that came out that was consistent across high-performing teams uh, is the element of psychological safety. So as you think about out of the gate, what can you do to create the conditions for your team, particularly since it's a virtual team, where there's a sense of psychological safety that invites openness and learning and high levels of participation and my sense about you, just given the thoughtfulness of your question, is that you absolutely have the capacity to do that. Thanks for introducing that. That's great. I, I have not used those words anywhere on the look and sound of leadership yet, but I, they're very meaningful, and I agree with you. Great. Thanks. Before we go on, I'm going to do a little commentary, two quick things. The first thing I want to talk about is gratitude. Every month, all of you hear me express my thanks to you, to the listening audience. I tell you, thank you for the emails you send me, for the questions, for the dialogue we have, for the PDFs you ask for, and I say particular thanks to those of you who write reviews in iTunes. I tell you all how important those reviews are, and I read off your names, and I mention the countries you're from. This month, there's one new review. Oh, Hope 125 from New Zealand. Thank you so much, but thank you to all of you. And I hope that that sounds familiar. I hope you hear me express my thanks all the time. Well, once a year, I also recognize the folks who are behind the scenes. I said at the top of the show, my voice might be the only one that you hear, but there's a crew of people who help me get to the finish line every month. It is true, and I thank them once a year, and this year... Five of the people who help me are my friends. They edit my work every month. I want to tell you, you should be thankful for them too because they make my work so much better. They are so thoughtful and insightful and so generous. I am grateful for each of their very distinct contributions. They are, in no particular order, Nancy Brewer and then our very own Mindy Dana. Thank you very much, Mindy. Nancy Shanfeld, Tom Mannheim, and Graham Burns. Thanks to each of you. And then... The two guys who just keep Essential Communications running, they do all the branding and all our presence to the world, Paul Eisen, the creator of Eisen Design, and George Avellino, who just makes everything work so easily. Essential Communications would not be able to do what it does. For example, you, the listener, would not be able to have access to the archive the way you do without George and Paul. So thank you so much, you guys. You really make a world of difference. That's the first of the two things. The second thing that I want to talk about are resources. Mindy's already given you a little bit of talk about resources. I want to add to that. My hope always for these Q&A shows is that you're going to hear a lot of different things and that the different things we say may spark you. When that happens, the odds are you can keep that spark going in the Essential Communications Archive. It's at EssentialCom.com. It's EssentialCom with two Ms.com. And then it's under podcast or under coaching tips. There's lots of ways in the archive for you to think about your own development. Some of the filters are leadership, management skills, self-talk, 
relationship building. And then every month, you know that I say, hey, and five other episodes you might listen to. So I'm going to actually link up episodes to the reader letters. The first letter from James about being engaged, if that got your attention, you might listen to the episode called A Breakdown of Listening. The second email was from Chris about careers. If you want resources for that, actually, I would send you off the Essential Communications website. I would send you to the Coaching for Leaders website. Create a login for yourself and then sort the episode library with the filter career growth. There are great resources in there for you. And those resources are going to lead you to other resources. It's Coaching for Leaders, Episode Library, Career Growth. And then we just talked about Colin. Colin and his broad ideas of leadership. If that sparked you, you might listen to two episodes of mine, Leadership versus Management, and then The Sound of Leadership and Management. And Mindy, the name of the book that you talked about was? Being the Boss. By? Linda Hill. Great. Thanks. And then we're about to hear from a woman named Caitlin. If what Caitlin talks about and what we talk about in answer, if those ideas interest you, go into the archive with the filter Managing Yourself. There's going to be a lot of different paths in there that you can follow. Okay, those were my two things, gratitude and resources. By the way, those of you who know sorting and labeling, I hope you hear me doing sorting and labeling. (laughs) Sorting and labeling, got to love it. Okay, so we're on to the final question from Caitlin. When speaking with top executives, I often feel less than and doubtful of my opinions and thoughts. When I do not know an answer to their question or when I get nervous, I seem to black out and just not say anything at all. Wow. So this was powerful for me to read because I, I, I think there's two different issues that might be going on, but only one of them probably is applicable, but I don't know which it is. The words that concerned me were the words black out, where she says, I seem to black out and not say anything, to which I go, really? I mean, really black out? Like if I caught you after the meeting and I said to you, Caitlin, hey, what happened to you? You would go, oh my God, I don't know. Like you went unconscious. Then I would say, that's alarming. That sounds like trauma to me. And I think you should get help. Find someone to help you because that's serious. If you are truly blacking out of your life, when stress gets high, uh, you need to attend to that. But if we just take that little phrase out, then I go, oh, okay, I feel less than, I'm doubtful of my opinions and my thoughts. Then I go, oh, this sounds like kind of normal to me. This sounds like anxiety and stress and taking your place in the world. So much of the look and sound of leadership has been about issues like that. I want to say that the biggest challenge that I find for people who are struggling with this issue is the concept of incremental development. Here's what happens. Let's imagine that I'm coaching Caitlin and I give her some tool, whatever the tool is to stay present or whatever Caitlin talks about it. And I give her a little an antidote, not an anecdote, but an (laughs) antidote for it. And then she goes into her next meeting and she can do it a little bit, but then she can't do it at all that often what she's going to come out and go is, see, I suck. See, I can't do this. See, I'm awful. I knew I, and and it justifies all her doubt. And I go, whoa, 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 stop. You have to think about incremental improvement. You're trying to overcome maybe decades of programming in your head. And look, you got it right for 30 seconds, maybe 90 seconds. That's a big deal. You have to celebrate the win in order to allow the trajectory to keep going. So you have to have a lot of compassion for yourself. That's my thought. What about you? Well, when I I read the the phrase, I seem to black out, the way I interpreted it was there are times when we are in a high-stress situation or we feel anxious and we sort of experience this sort of amygdala hijack where you go to that fight or flight part of your brain where you just can't think cuz i mean literally all you know all the energy in your body is going towards fleeing or fainting or fighting and so it's hard to think from the prefrontal cortex from the sort of executive function part of your brain so i can i i can relate to that i've been in situations where i didn't black out but my mind went blank and that's oh. when i just yes so the mind just goes blank and then because i'm in just sort of that sort of hijack space that I can't think of anything intelligent to, to say or think. And then it just gets into this sort of doom loop of, oh my God, I'm just going to have to fake a seizure. So 
Um, <laughs> so, Caitlin, what I would say, so the, if that's the case, if it's sort of amygdala hijack and you just feel that sort of minor panic, and I know you know this, but I'm going to say it, and that is take a moment and take a big, deep breath. Because one way and name sort of, we, we often use with an amygdala hijack the idea of name it to tame it because it gets you into a different part of your brain. So just say, I'm feeling anxious or I'm feeling stressed. Take a big, huge, deep breath. And that can often get your brain back online into the prefrontal cortex. So if I were Caitlin and I said to you, well, but wait, look, they're all looking at me already. And I already feel like an idiot. Like I'm supposed to take a big breath. That's just going to make me look like more of an idiot. And you would say? I would say, actually, I think that demonstrates that you're, you're being thoughtful. I think sometimes what feels like this extremely long, painful pause, to me, when I see people who take a minute to think or take a deep breath, I often think, wow, they're really giving this some thought. That gives me a sense of, well, they're giving my question some some real attention that I think it merits or I wouldn't be even bringing it up. And the thing I would say too is if you're if you're really talking about dealing with top executives, the things that they're dealing with often are so complex, Caitlin, that there isn't one right answer. And what they really need is a multitude of perspectives because it's not possible for them to see everything that they need to see. So the fact is your perspective is really valuable because it's yours and that's what they want. So taking a minute and saying, actually, my perspective has merit and value. They don't know it, and they're asking me because they want to know it. Caitlin, thanks. That was great. And to all of you, thank you so much. This was fun to do. We are hoping to do three or four a year of these, so let us know how we're doing. And Mindy, thank you for being here. I thank you. I feel honored to be a part of this inaugural Q&A show. I hope that the mailbox gets stuffed with many more questions and look forward to our next conversation. Me too. Until next time, I'm Tom Henschel. Thanks so much for listening.